Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Karen Tawani for her second appearance on The Lowdown. Karen is here today to discuss his new book, Glorious Reinvention, The Rebirth of Ajax Amsterdam. Karan, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me back on, Connor. It's good to be back. Been just over a year now we've been discussing off camera. Uh, a lot has changed in the footballing world. Obviously, a second book from your part. First book being the fantastic one, which was on Red Bull. The second one being now on Ajax. What inspired you to get back out there and um, write a new book? Uh, well, the process for writing the book itself on, on the professional side was basically, I've heard this when I wrote my first book, that when you've written that first book, every author has the itch to go and get that second book done as, as quickly as possible. It was the same for me as well. So I had a few ideas of what I wanted to go with, but Ajax was the one that I eventually settled on. Firstly, because I knew the topic itself quite well. And secondly, because Ajax are Ajax. And, you know, you'd be surprised by how little coverage there is of Ajax in the English language. And that's not just books, that's online as well. So there's surprisingly little written about them, uh, especially uh, with the period I covered in the early 21st century of Ajax. So, uh, so I felt there was a, an important story that needed to be told. And Ajax are a historically great club. You know, if you watch football, I know so many people, and I'm sure there's so many around the world that have Ajax as this sort of second team. So unless you support Fire or PSV, Ajax are by default your second team because they're outside the Europe, they're outside Europe's top five leagues. They are uh, attractive to watch. They have a good history in the game. Great legends have come from 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 Ajax. So uh, yeah, that was it was a combination of my own professional goals combined with Ajax, the story being there to be told. And sure, there's a huge story to be told. Um, just from reading initial snippets of the book, Dos Karan, the book is split into three separate parts bringing us from the early 1990s to the current day. However, it's quite clear that it hasn't really always been plain sailing at Ajax. No, it hasn't, no. I think that, you know, there's a period after they won the Champions League in 1995 till about 2010, so that 15-year period, it wasn't the prettiest uh, of times for Ajax. You know, when you think of the great Ajax sides of the past from 70s, 80s, 90s, there's a lot of history and a lot of trophies won. Um, but that period from 1995 on, or 1997 rather onwards, uh, after they lost the Champions League final in 96, uh, it was a bit of a stale time purely because it was them trying to adapt to modern European football. Um, so while other other clubs in other countries were excelling, Ajax were lacking behind uh, because they weren't able to adapt in terms of the transfers, in terms of squad planning, in terms of uh, commercialization, in terms of marketing the club abroad. So that's where they sort of suffered. And uh, that eventually came down to uh, a call for change by Johan Cruyff in 2010. And I'm sure we get, get to that later in the interview, but uh, yeah, that, that was that 15 year period was one that involved lots of mismanagement, lots of uh, financial negligence. And they sort of forgot the great values that made Ajax such a special club, which was, you know, the youth academy and, and focusing on players for the future. And that was shown in their results eventually that they failed to win a league title from 2004 onwards until 2011. Uh, and, and, you know, even the European campaigns were quite mediocre. So it was just a combination of a lot of things going wrong at the top that made uh, Ajax suffer so much in that period. And maybe that's why we see it on the present day with former esteemed players such as Edwin van der Sar and the later to be disgraced Mark Overmars getting on board within the club's hierarchy to kind of negate some of the complacency which we saw in the 90s and early noughties. But if we're to focus on the 90s in particular, Karan, because for me, it just seems like a complete roller coaster for a decade. You have the Champions League final win in 1995. However, in between that two, you have to move into the Amsterdam Arena, and then you have the whole club be sat by a cultural onslaught, really, from the one and only Johan Cruyff. Yeah, it was it was a topsy turvy era. That 19, the 99 was literally a, a decade of two halves, where until 95, they were excelling in Europe. Louis van Gaal came in, won the UEFA. Uh, was contributing to uh, European success and won more than just the Champions League. He was domestically, even the, the 95 season, one of the greatest European teams of all time because they were uh, unbeaten in the league and they went on to win the Champions League as well. So that was quite great for them. And it was an overall ch structure change, you know, that involved football. That Louis, that football was a centrepiece where Louis van Gaal was seen as the guy to take them forward. And he did, he did well for what he had. He built a squad of great players that were mostly homegrown. So that, that's something that's rare in football itself. But after that, uh, when they moved to the Amsterdam Arena, it was 
the stadium move wasn't welcomed uh, very well by the fans because they felt the personal touch they had at their previous ground, the Mir, uh, was kind of lost. They felt that they were a bit too far from the from the pitch. From that they were they were not able to sort of you know get in touch with their players as well as they could previously. So it took them about 10, 15 years until they won the league in 2011 to sort of accept the Amsterdam Arena as their home. Uh, so that was there as well. And then came the IPO in, in, in the same year where the, the club went public. And uh, that sort of made the traditional supporters feel like they were losing touch with the club. They were referred to as customers quite often rather than supporters or fans. And that was seen as quite offensive for themselves. So that was a problem as well. And the money that came in from going public was wasted uh, because they spent on projects abroad that were that were not very well planned. So there was a financial dip in, in there as well. And, and I read once that uh, if FFP or Financial Fair Play was around at the time, Ajax would have been barred from the European competition because they were that negligent with their money. So that that was a big problem for them as well. So it was, it was just a, the, the 90s can be seen as a, as, a, as a decade of two halves where the first half was incredibly successful, uh, where they made one of the great European teams of all time. And the second half was seen as throwing it all away. And that was best, best exemplified by the Bosman rule coming in and them losing all their players almost on a free transfer. And one of the most interesting things to note was that you've begun this conversation by saying Ajax have been early criminally kind of underreported within the English-speaking world. I mean, obviously with Johan Cruyff playing such a centrepiece and the rejuvenation of the club over the past two decades, and obviously we know him purported and portrayed in Western media too, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors about Johan Cruyff. We have the infamous rivalry between himself and Louis van Gaal. I mean, how important for you, Karan, was it that in fact you portrayed a kind of fair depiction of Johan Cruyff in this book. Well, oh, very important. Actually, I think um, you know, away from Ajax itself and away from Dutch football, I think Johan Cruyff is the most influential figure in football itself. You know, you can talk about his greatness as a player, his greatness as a manager, but his influence overall, his 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 influence is still felt to this day, and it will be for the next two three decades or so and beyond. But that, that, is, that is the impact he's had. But in terms of Ajax itself, as you mentioned, uh, you know, his impact was there as a player, as a manager, and eventually as a person from the outside who just wanted the best for Ajax. Uh, when he had his Velvet Revolution in 2010, or it was called the Velvet, Velvet Revolution because it was meant to be a peaceful uh, change in power at the top, his main uh, objectives were to see former players leading the club again because they understood Ajax. Uh, his main, one of his objectives was to see younger players coming in from the academy and the academy coaches and the academy system being more refined uh, so that they can produce these top players. And we've seen the results in that in people like Matthijs de Ligt, Tony van der Beek, uh, Andre Onana. Uh, and, you know, we've seen, and, and the other one was to not spend or not be as wasteful in the transfer market. So only spend on players that they won't be able to develop at the academy. And that's sort of been there. So, the entire success that Ajax have had right now can't entirely be attributed to Johan Cruyff, but they took elements of his of his beliefs and, and integrated it into the modern team. Um, so they were willing to spend more, but the elements of old from Johan Cruyff were still there. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it, to sum up, even that he's, he's had a big say in what Ajax do, and he will continue to have it for a very long time because Ajax is Cruyff and Cruyff is Ajax. And it's just... It's just Hand in hand, it's a perfect marriage. That's a fair way of putting it. And as we speak about the two main things Johan Cruyff did for me that time when he came back into Ajax, one was bringing in the former players to positions of influence. And number two was addressing the academy system, which you just elaborated upon, Karan. I mean, contrary to popular belief, the academy at Ajax was flagging for quite a while. And it's only been in the last few years we've kind of seen kind of a stockpile of talent coming through the doors. Frankie De Jong, Matthias De Ligt. We look at the current bunch, including Ryan Gravenberg and Yuri and Timber. I mean, on to your research on the book, Karen, could you perhaps elaborate and take us into some of the processes and procedures that the infamous academy at Ajax has for developing these youthful stairs? Yeah, so um, Ajax, obviously, we know, as you mentioned, the academy is their biggest centerpiece. To, it's the centerpiece of what Ajax do. It's is supposed to be the heart of the club and it always will be the heart of the club. Uh, and for a while it was forgotten in the middle because according to Cruyff and according to many around Ajax, it was being neglected for because Ajax wanted immediate success. Uh, so the objective according to Cruyff for the academy should be that they, they don't need to win games all the time, but they need to improve as footballers. So winning isn't the main objective. Winning will come 
after these players are taught at the right level. So for a long time, that was ignored. And when Cruyff came back and sort of demanded change, that philosophy was brought back. Uh, he wanted players to understand what Ajax were. So, you know, maintain that touch of players and, 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 and you know, playing in a particular system that's, that's expansive, that's, that's looking forward to the next step. Um, so that was the whole objective of it. And, and recent times, they've invested a lot in the academy itself in terms of bringing in top coaches. Uh, their scouting network's gone well beyond uh, what they used to do before or what they didn't do for the early part of the 2000s or the 21st century. And, uh, you know, investment in technology. And they want players to have fun. They want players to not focus solely on winning, but on improving themselves and getting to the best level they can get to. And as I said, I said before, that's been reflected in the current squad. Uh, people like Matthijs De Ligt were there, um, Donny van der Beek was there, Ryan Gravenberg, Jürgen Timber, all these players will have big careers or will play uh, at top clubs around Europe. So um, that's what it's meant to be. And they don't just want to make players that are capable of playing in the Eredivisie. They want to make players who are capable of challenging at the Champions League level. And that's what they've been able to do for the last two or three years. It's not easy for a club outside Europe's top five leagues to do so because of the financial restraints they have on them. But Ajax are... They found a way to do it, and it's it's proven to be quite successful for them. I think the greatest legacy which Cruyff left behind this time was that, as he always has done, to be honest, too, at Barcelona. I mean, he's left behind a legacy where their success cannot be attributed really to any few figures. In fact, the key figures are always interchangeable at these places Cruyff has worked at, where by and large he leaves a system, he leaves a set of procedures in place where success just continues to roll, really. Yeah, uh, you know, it has to be, even at Ajax, when he was there, and he mentioned at Barcelona, there has to be a long-term plan, and a plan of continuous improvement where, you know, even if regardless of people, if people leave or players or staff leave, there is a, a long-term plan to sort of see them grow and see them continue their, their success. Uh, and that's, that's sort of ingrained into the Ajax philosophy and Ajax mentality now, that they know their top stars will leave, their top figures will leave. Uh, and that can be players or coaches. We've seen it recently with Eric Ten Hag as well, you know, who was one of the final pieces of the Ajax jigsaw. He's been going, he's going to go to Man United now. So um, so that's that's always there. It's part of the philosophy that as one star goes, they should always have another star in the pipeline. And, you know, people building up, uh, building that player up. So it's just ingrained now that they know that they will lose the top players to top European clubs because the appeal of playing in England, Germany, Italy, France, Spain, whatever, is far bigger than the appeal of playing in the Netherlands. No, no disrespect to them, but that's the state of the game right now where the money and the attraction of playing abroad is far bigger than it is playing in the RDBC, regardless of how great Ajax become or like how great Ajax are. Um, so that's, that's always there. And it's a bit of a shame that you know many of these top players won't stay at Ajax for long because... They do have an attractive style and, and they build great teams. The 2019 team, if they stayed on for perhaps a year or two longer, who knows how far they may have got. They may have won the Champions League in a couple of years. Um, so that's that's always been there. And, and But it's now ingrained that they want to have a long-term plan, as I mentioned. And that's just, that's just the axe way now. That is, one star goes, none is always in the making. And speaking about him briefly, Eric Ten Hag, I mean, what can Man United fans expect of the incumbent Ten Hag. I mean, playing devil's advocate here, Karan, does winning multiple Eredivisie championships qualify you for a post of that magnitude at Old Trafford? It's fair to say that I think that, um, you know, in the Eredivisie, I actually do have a financial and competitive advantage that they've built themselves. Uh, so, you know, they are more likely or most likely to win multiple league and cup titles uh, in the division because they have their advantage that they've sort of given themselves. Um, but I personally do think he's very ready for the job. Uh, I think that it's a job that's come as a result of, once again, I just phrase, continuous improvement. He was at uh, Go Ahead Eagles first in the start of his career. He took that club to promotion to the top division in, in the Netherlands. He worked at Bayern Munich in the second team under Pep Guardiola, so it's a good experience. And he took those learnings to Utrecht. Oh, sorry. He took those learnings to Utrecht uh, in the Eredivisie, which is a mid-level club, and he took them to European football. And then he went to the biggest club in the Netherlands and he won multiple league titles as well as performing in Europe in the Champions League and in the Europa League. So the improvement has been there year on year. year. So I think that it's only right that he now has a job in England with a club that's in need of a rebuild and the sort of reinvention that he's had that he's had before Ajax. So uh, I personally think he's ready for the job. Uh, and in terms of what he can do there, I think he 
it will it will get worse before it gets better for him. Not only because it's a tough job, but because he has to do his part as well as clean up the mess left before him. So a lot of it will be determined by how much support he gets firstly, and secondly, how much uh, of the squad can be turned in his first transfer window, in his first season. Because a lot of players have to leave there, and a lot of players have to join. Uh, so I expect him to be successful, but the success will only be seen in after a, after a season or so. And he has to be given the right backing to sort of perform his job. I think too, what would be good for anyone listening to Karan is just inform us of kind of the day-to-day life of working at IX2 because what many people will be unaware of is that Ten Hag will be moving into this role at Old Trafford, well versed in managing up, managing commercial relationships. Because coaching and being a first team coach at IX certainly isn't an easy job in terms of all the management stuff you have to do. No, yeah, so it's a much more different job uh, at Ajax compared to Man United. I think that, you know, the level of attention you will get at Man United compared to Ajax is quite different. I'm not disrespect to Ajax at all. They're perfectly in the conversation for being that big club that we always talk about. Um, so, you know, it's the same in terms of football level, but in terms of commercial level and in terms of the attention that Man United get, get compared to Ajax, uh, there is a, a big, big difference that he will maybe even be shocked by it. I mean, Jose, Jose Mourinho was shocked by it and he's one of the most popular managers in the, in the world. So uh, it's, it's always a, a, an issue he's going to face and managing that is going to be one of his bigger challenges at the club because as proven, and this is one of the bigger worries I have about, his, about him taking up the job is that as proven by his time at Ajax, he was purely a football coach where he focused solely on football and he had a football group around him and people like Marco Ogamage to sort of support him. Uh, but he... As of now, he it seems as though Man United are building towards having that at Man United as well. But it it'll be left to see how much support he gets in that regard uh, uh, in the coming months. And Paul Sterrington Hag, what does the future look like for Ajax? Uh, it's going to be a big summer. First, the summer is going to be very interesting because it's not just Ten Hag leaving. Uh, as you mentioned before, Marco Overmars left and he had to go. Uh, so there, there will definitely be a new director of football coming in, and the club have confirmed this as well. Uh, Klaas and Huntler has been training in the job, but I doubt he'll get the job on a full-time basis or, or on a permanent basis. Um, so there will be a new director of football coming in. I imagine it'll be another ex-player. Um, and along with that, there will be players departing the club in the summer, along with Ten Hag. So Ryan Gravenberg and Nuzair Masrawi have been set to go to Bayern Munich, and I think both of those deals will happen. Andre Onana is very likely to go to Inter, so that's that's three players gone already. And there have always been stories about other players going as well. Anthony and Sebastian Haller, Julian Timber have all been linked away, even with Man United to join Ten Hag there. So it's going to be a big turnover in terms of this squad. So it's not just the coaching director of football going, the players will change as well. So it seems like the start of a new era for Ajax. Uh, and it seems as though there's going to be a lot of things happening in the summer itself because they need to find the right balance again. And We'll see how it goes. I don't. I don't imagine that they will be quite as successful in Europe in the coming years as they were previously. But I imagine the domestic uh, dominance should continue for at least another season or two. That was going to be my final question, Karan. I mean, obviously, we speak a lot about the European Super League on the show. We speak about competitive imbalance. In fact, I mean, we speak about competitive imbalance on a continental level. But if we're looking at a regional and a domestic level, really between Ajax and PSV Eindhoven, there really is no other competition. In the area of easy, I mean, are those Bami Champions League nights of twenty of uh, spring and summer twenty nineteen a fair cry away from what we can expect of this Ajax side in the future? It seems as though it seems like I think the best chance to replicate that was this season, and it just it's just unfortunate they lost to Benfica because they were having an incredible first half of the season, and when the draw was made. There was a lot of excitement about it because there was a general feeling they could beat Benfica and they should have. They lost in the second leg to one shot conceded. And it's just football sometimes, just fine margins. Uh, but it's just unfortunate how that happened. But I don't think that can be replicated. The 2019 can be replicated for quite a long time because of, as I mentioned, the squad turnover. I'd be, I'd be very surprised if they're able to do it anytime soon. But the squad turnover is just too much to make it happen one more time. Um, I hope it does, obviously. But I think that they're going to have to settle for domestic dominance for now. And I think the gap between themselves and PSV uh, has closed down a bit this season. I think PSV improved. Obviously, they're going to have a new head coach in next season as well. Uh, but they sh- PSV will feel that, you know, because of all, all that's happening at Ajax, they should be able to take advantage of what's happening and finally win another league title again because it's been 
uh, four, four years, five years now that they haven't won the league title. So they'll feel that this is the best chance they can get to sort of catch Ajax out and win another title and, and you know, establish themselves as the top side in the Netherlands. Finally, to close, I mean, of course, you've authored your maiden book on Red Bull, your second book now on Ajax. Have you any, I suppose, aspirations to complete the hat-trick anytime soon, Karan? Uh, surprisingly, no. I thought that, you know, the second book, uh, both books were quite challenging to do. The first one, and the biggest challenge was the first one is that it was written in lockdown, so it was quite easy to do. Uh, I didn't have much time constraints. The second one was a little more challenging because of the, as I mentioned, time constraints that I had. I had a lot more work to finish, a, a different life to live. Um, so I don't, I don't think the third book's going to happen anytime soon. It's quite exhausting as well. It takes up, it's, it's a completely fun experience. If anyone's listening to that wants to write a book, it's, it's a completely, uh, it's a brilliant experience overall. I, I recommend doing it, but it's going to take up a lot of time from your life because you need about seven, eight, maybe a year. Uh, seven eight months of your year to to sort of focus on that it takes up that much time of your life you know it's sort of the last thing you think of when you sleep and the first thing you think of when you when you wake up so you know if you were to do it great and good for you and best of luck but it does take a lot of time so i think i'm going to take a break from it for a couple of years and for anyone that is actually crazy enough to follow in your footsteps and uh, arthur a book karan what bit of advice would you have for them? uh just go for it uh you know it, it's it's quite challenging because you will feel that you're losing your way along the way. But as long as you have a plan in mind and a, a plan of what you're going to do and what you want to achieve by the end of it, it seems like the, it, you are probably going to get it done. It's just a case of structuring it very well and understanding what you're doing. And it will take a, it will take a while before you feel that you're falling, in lo- you're falling in love with your project. Um, it took me a while for the book, uh, the Ajax book itself, because I thought I was losing my way. But once you've found your love for it while writing it, uh, I think you'll be quite good to sort of sort the whole way out. Ran, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on once again. Um, I'll be sure to attach all the links um, to buy the book in the show notes below. Yeah, thank you so much, Connor, for having me on.